and friends. Um, it's a blessing to be with you this morning, um, to be sharing God's word with you. Um, our readings this morning are wonderful, and I indeed have wrestled with them as Jacob has wrestled with God over the course of the week. Um, but let us pray. Precious Father, we open ourselves to you, asking for your nearness and closeness, closeness to us as we reflect on your words and as we offer ourselves to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so, were the patriarchs real people? Did Jacob really exist? Or are the stories in Genesis in the realm of myth? Well, there's no direct evidence anywhere in history for the existence of the patriarchs. So some scholars want to say that they never existed. Rather, they say that these stories are a compilation of events from the early settlement period of the Hebrew tribes, around about the time of Judges, uh, that's about 1000 BC. And that these stories are a conflation of oral traditions that were compiled to create a national history. Uh, much like some might say that the Great Trek became the founding mythology of the Africana peoples. But there are elements of historicity that lead us to the conclusion that the stories may be grounded in truth. And these are that the names of people in the Genesis stories are not found uh, in the more recent scriptures, Hebrew scriptures. And in fact, the first time uh, the name of Jacob is found again in, in scripture is uh, in the time of the latter prophets, that is 600 BC. They also say that the descriptions of customs that were uh, described in, in the book of Genesis uh, date are matched by uh, archaeological records, for example, in the uh, Nuzi uh, um, inscriptions in cuneiform found in Middle Iraq. There are descriptions of people um, passing off their wives as their sisters so as to avoid being killed by uh, marauding men who want to steal their wives. Um, there are also descriptions of uh, people taking slaves as concubines when, when women are barren, and these very much match um, some of the uh, customs that are portrayed um, in the story of Abraham. There are also descriptions of a wandering warlike people called the Habiru or the Hiskos that are present in archaeological artifacts found in Egypt um, and Palestine um, in uh, in, in, in times that correspond with, with the, the Genesis accounts. So perhaps there is some truth and actuality in the stories of Genesis. But whatever, what is perhaps most intriguing to me is that the content of the stories and the heroic status of the patriarchs, particularly Jacob, are at odds. Jacob, who is essentially the founder of the Israelites because his name was changed to Israel, is at first glance a dubious character who lives a complicated and a fractious life. He cheats his brother of his birthright. He deceives his father for the patriarchal blessing. He incurs the wrath of his family and then runs away rather than face up to his actions, not once, but several times. He schemes and devises plans to increase his wealth. And he treats his wives and children unjustly by actively favoring some over others. And so when we look at his life, we wonder what was there about this man that he should be held up as worthy of such an honor of being called a patriarch? And further, what is it about the Jewish people that leads them to retain the story, warts and all, and not to sanitize it with hand sanitizer and hand disinfectant to make Jacob a nice, morally upstanding and admirable leader worthy of the status of patriarch? Well, the key to Jacob, I think, and what defines him, and indeed all the heroes of the Jewish faith, are his openness to encounter God and his vulnerability, all in the context of someone who is presented as being like us, morally dubious, caught up in the complexities of life, joys, strivings, conflict, revenge, disappointment, deception, hope and despair. And that in the midst of these key anxieties of life, the threats of annihilation, of meaningless, of abandonment and guilt, 
Jacob encounters God in such graphic and inspirational ways that they have become metaphors for our own civilization's hopes and terrors and struggles and triumphs. The name Jacob is very similar and probably derived from the place name Yahkabel, meaning let God protect. He's favored by his mother, who helps him, we infer, to deceive his father into giving the blessing due to the firstborn. His father, in realizing the animosity that this has created, sends Jacob away, ostensibly to find a wife. And it is in the midst of this abandonment and fleeing from a vengeful Esau, this in-between space where Jacob has left his old home and is not yet part of a new one, he dreams of something profoundly inspirational, a stairway to heaven, an outrageous dream because it represents God engaging with humankind. On the back of this hope, he makes his way back into Laban's household. He acquires two wives and much property, but the relationship between him and Laban deteriorates to the point where he, once again, gathers up his possessions and flees. And it's at this time that his heart and his courage fail him. Most likely all his abandonment memories come flooding back. And in verse 9 to 12 of chapter 32, he cries out to God, perhaps for the first time in his life, prayers of vulnerability and surrender. O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and I will do good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, that he will come and kill us all, the mothers with their children. And that night, perhaps in fear, perhaps out of a need to gather himself, he sends his family across the river towards Esau's land without him. And in the night, this mysterious event happens. We don't know who this powerful person is who wrestles with Jacob, and neither does he. But after wresting a blessing from this person in the morning, Jacob says, I have seen the face of God and survived. The story has become a metaphor for our wrestling with God. And who of us has not gone arm to arm with God, metaphorically speaking, as we struggle with all that life lays in our path, the things that happen to us and those that happen inside of us? Many of us, if not all of us, found ourselves, find ourselves wrestling with God at this moment, at this time in the middle of our corona pandemic. Life for us all has changed and bears little resemblance to former times. And these changes have caused ripples or shockwaves to enter our inner lives. The COVID pandemic has precipitated circumstances which are forcing us to look inward. During this past week, I had the privilege to work at a Nazarek Field Hospital for coronavirus patients. And many people are deeply traumatized by their experiences of uh, going into casualty, seeing people die around them and have moments when they've encountered death for themselves for the first time. And a particular patient said to me that his life will not be the same again. He has a second chance and he is so grateful for the fact that he survived this disease. And I also heard this week of a dear friend whose marriage is in deep trouble uh, most likely precipitated due to the difficulties of uh, the last few months, uh, both financially and from the habits of life perspective. And I myself am looking deeply inward, wondering who am I and, and how have I come to be in this place at this time and what is the meaning of my life going forward. Courage is required to look at that which is hidden from us when life goes well. There are no easy answers, and indeed, the passage through the struggle is the way forward. And like Jacob, we are richer for engaging 
and for the struggle. We leave the encounter as Jacob is and we are, if we engage, changed and move forward. If God blesses us with new grace and gifts and insight and ultimately with generosity of heart to both ourselves and to others. And the consolation for me in the midst of this struggle, this Corona time struggle, is found in the two other readings for the day. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, speaks of the legacy of the Jews and reminds us that our struggles are not isolated in time and space. We, Christians, and all peoples today, are part of the continuum of God's engagement with humankind. A God who hasn't just created the world and let it run, but rather a God who engages, who chooses people, who covenants with people, who wrestles with his people. Paul, when speaking of the Israelites, whose inheritance is open to all of humankind, says, they are the Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. And to them belong the patriarchs and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God be blessed forever. Amen. And lastly, in our gospel, we have the beautiful image of Jesus, full of compassion, offering the people that is us, all that is necessary to sustain life and hope in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. The image of Jesus offering up the loaves and the fish, the blessing and the breaking and the sharing, becomes the paradigmatic image of the Eucharist, of Jesus offering himself at the Last Supper as a way of joining in with us in the struggles of life, death, abandonment, and meaninglessness. And as we face our own struggles, financial, relational, struggles to know and love and accept ourselves for who we are, we are not alone. We are accompanied by the saints through the millennia, starting with Jacob, wrestled with God, and ending with those who have gone before us in the present time. And most beautifully, we are accompanied by Jesus himself, who in his parting words to the disciples in Matthew's Gospel says, And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Amen.